We've done shows recently on the effects of depression in men. Uh, we've talked about trauma in the past, addictions and the like. How do you pick up the pieces? Today, we're going to have a discussion with my guest, Joel Carroll, about just that very topic. Redemption after trauma and turmoil. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Let's Chew the Gum. I'm your host, Protocol. We talk a lot about a lot of things in this show. While we chew the gum, and just like every show, we always have something for your mind. 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 Something for your mind. 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 Something for your mind. Something for your mind. Something for your for your Welcome to this latest edition of Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z while we chew the gum. I want to welcome my guest today. Um, we're going to have a pretty in-depth discussion just about the redemptive values in life, um, overcoming trauma, depression, anxiety, and, and just the life. Let's just call it that life and, and where we may find ourselves. My guest today is Joel Carroll. Joel Carroll is, I don't know if it's a new author. I think when you're an author and you have a book like yours, that's something you've been writing all along, whether you knew it or not. Welcome to the show, Joel. Thank you for having me. No, absolutely. It's definitely my pleasure, man. You know, it was um, interesting uh, meeting you and being able to talk with you um, uh, briefly when we did uh, prior to the show, um, because just a couple of weeks back, I had a guest on the show and our conversation uh, was surrounding uh, depression. All right, we were talking about uh, depression in men in particular, and how um, a lot of men are reticent, or you know, they're not willing to talk about it because it's it's um, just something that's been ingrained in us to to not talk about that type of uh, thing, whether it's depression or you know trauma or anxieties or whatever. Um, and so now, you know, we get to come back and have a discussion uh, with you because you know your 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 book is out um but your uh, book is full of remnants from your life and so i wanted to be able to you know utilize that to empower um our listening audience and to just shed some light on some of the things that folks go through in life um so I'm going to let you just sort of uh, kind of introduce that aspect and, and sort of talk about, you know, your early life and what are some of the things that led to where you are today. OK, I appreciate it. So I was born in Phoenix in 1978 and my father was in the military, so we moved really quickly. I was about two years old, went to Virginia, in Virginia. We went to Europe. Well, I was in Europe. I had some cool things that happened in my life. I played soccer for three years, went skiing in Austria. I was in a commercial in Amsterdam, a Mickey Mouse commercial. And life was good. But I also had some things that really got to me, like uh, started seeing shadows that other people weren't seeing. And I didn't want to get made fun of while I was at school, but I was going to tell my best friend at the time, his name was Michael, that I was seeing these things, and then I also got confronted by a demonic entity while living right around the corner from an old graveyard. And the entire time that we lived there, I had something pulling me towards that chain link fence or calling me. And my older sister and the neighborhood kids never had the same actions while walking past it to the bus stop or sledding when it was snowing out there. And Eventually, I started noticing shadows coming from that chain leaf, the area, that graveyard, and then a demonic entity ended up in my room. 
in the middle of the night, I was going to tell my best friend Michael about this. Nobody else. He ended up passing away before I could tell him like three hours after he got off the school bus. So with having this demonic presence or the spiritual turmoil as a six year old, a seven year old, and then the loss of my best friend at that time, I didn't know what to ask. You know, as a child, I believed in God. My mother always spoke of God. But when I tried to pray as a young child, there was no light that shined down on my bed. There was no powerful voice telling me it's going to be okay, what the answers are. Why would somebody at such a young age pass away like that if there was a God? So there was a lot of questions. And then we ended up moving to Phoenix, back to Phoenix, for three more years after that. And I had a good life. And I had a lot of friends. I was a teeny little guy. I was smaller than all the girls that I hung out with in first, second, and third grade. But then some kid came to the school, a new kid, and uh, he was the same stature as I was. Blonde haired, blue eyed kid, though. And he didn't like the fact that there was another young, you know, small kid that had a lot of friends. So everybody was talking about he wanted to fight me. And my pride and my ego at that time wouldn't allow me to tell my friends no. Like, I don't want to fight. I've never fought before. I used to watch Sugar Ray Leonard, Duran, Hagler, Hearns fight. My father was a boxer in the military. Mm -hmm. But that's all I knew of fighting. And then watching The Karate Kid back in the 80s, that was my favorite movie. But after school, my buddies, we walked around to where the ice cream truck was. And there was a huge circle of like 50, 60 kids. And that kid was standing right in the middle. I didn't want to go in there, you know, and they were like, just don't be a chicken. So, you know, I puff up my little chest and my little bird chest that I had, and right. they pushed me in that circle. And only thing I knew how to do was do like the karate kid crank kick. And everybody started laughing at me. And I just knew it was my time. You know, it was like my time to shine in life. And they were going to hold me up like a trophy and they were going to carry me around the golf course and it was going to be awesome. But I ended up missing when I kicked and everybody started making fun of me. But my group of friends and the girls that we hung out with and it started to change something inside me, inside my spirit, inside my body. And next thing you know, I'm being pulled down the fairway and they're telling me to run. And the kid was on the ground, and there's like five kids standing over him with their hands covering their their mouths. I didn't know what happened. But my buddies were like, just run. Run, Joel. You got to run. Mm. The next day, the police were at the school, and my father was TDY traveling for the military. My mom was pulled out of work early in the morning. And the police were in the principal's office, and my buddies are pointing me out. And uh, they said I picked up a painted rock off the tee off green and I, I beat the kid half to death. And oh. I don't remember. I still don't remember. Oh, I was wow. 33 years ago. So I was a good kid. I liked people, you know, I, I made people laugh. I was a class clown. I never wanted to hurt anybody. But when I became uncomfortable, things started to happen. And I still didn't have any answers on to why my best friend passed away or why I was seeing shadows and a demonic presence, you know, was tormenting me in, in my bedroom in Europe or why some, you know, why, why do I forget what happens when I become upset? Mm -hmm. When, when things baffle me, I can't wrap my mind around a situation and don't know how to handle that situation. And it's like the click of a finger. I snap, I black out and it's, it's all over from there. Wow. Yeah, you know, I've, I've heard of folks in those situations that 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 black out and, and kind of don't know what happened. I, I haven't I haven't had that type of experience personally, but I've heard about it, you know, and I'm definitely not making light of of what you're saying when I when I talk about ways that I do black out. You know, I I, I grew up in, with hip hop culture as that evolved. I evolved and you know, I did a lot of freestyle rap battles. And when I would get in rap battles. Sometimes I get so into my myself, my mind 
that I would not be conscious of where I was. I, I would black out then and I would say these, you know, hellacious raps and, and, and flows just coming out. But I wouldn't remember who was there. It's like I can't see people. I see shapes, but I'm not seeing people. And that's com that's a totally different thing. But that's the closest that I can relate to blacking out and not remember. You know, somebody will say, oh, you said this, that or the other. And I, I, I'm like, I did. You know, I, I didn't remember because it was so, you know, rapid and, you know, sensory overflow. And, and perhaps there was some type of sensory overflow that, that you experienced with those emotions and and, and what you were feeling inside. And, and, you know, having that dark presence, as you spoke of over you, um, I, I can't imagine. So, you know, how do you you know, you're, you're a kid, um, you're a young kid. This situation happens. You know, is there a progression in this in this type of uh, the situations that you have or, you know, how, how does that how did that uh, trend? How was the transition from that to the next phase of your life? So, like immediately the next day, the kid was in the hospital. The police questioned me. They didn't believe me that I didn't remember. And then they told my parents and I was in in-school suspension. And I went out, I was doing all my, my schoolwork in a small cubicle in the office. When I walked out, it was just bright outside. I'm out in Arizona, 115 degrees, and I can't even see what's going on. And these two kids approached me who were his buddies. They started making fun of me, calling me crazy. You're a weirdo. You want to be karate kid. You're a joke. And it happened again. I ended up running after him and they caught him off guard and they ran into an abandoned house. And I punched through a window and pulled a kid out and I tried to stab him with a piece of glass. One of my buddies ran from where the buses were and he, he pulled me back into the yard. So long story short on that situation, the police came to the house after that happened. And my father was gone traveling for the military but my mother again she's like well what's going on you know i don't understand you're such a good kid you know i'm her baby regardless of whatever happened in life or what ended up happening in my life my mother was always there praying for me encouraging me you know just being a, a loving mother so she was kind of baffled about that situation and then at the drop of a dime my father was like well we're moving to virginia you moved you, you lived there when you were two years old but now we're moving back. And that gave me depression. That gave me anxiety, the fear of the unknown. And just the thought again of having to pack up all my little life that, that I created for myself to go almost 3000 miles away to a new school, don't know anybody and have to start all over again. That gave me extreme anxiety. And uh, that was situational. Uh -huh. What ended up happening was I love sports, you know, and I wanted to, I played Little League, I played AAU ball, I played Boys and Girls Club basketball as well. I collected sports cards, I could speak stats to anybody on the planet, adults, anybody about NBA stats, NFL stats, and Major League Baseball. And my parents were drinking the whole time. My father worked at the Pentagon, he was a functioning alcoholic. My mother too, she worked at a bank. She was actually the bank teller for that woman that everybody heard about, Lorena Bobbitt, that cut her husband's penis off. She, that was in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And life was good. You know, life was good in middle school. Had my friends, you know, going out, playing ball, having a good time. And, and that was my best time of my life when I was about 12 years old. That was the best year of my life. After That was 1990. Right. Yeah. That's after you moved to Virginia. Yeah, it, it was it's just, just amazing. Interesting. I, I actually lived in Virginia around that time, also um, military, okay. also. But you know, I, I've I've been uprooted once in my life um, as a teenager, moving about three thousand miles away when there was a, a bad situation um, in in life. You know, mid eighties crack epidemic in in the inner cities, mm -hmm. and and we moved. And I moved to uh, South Central L.A. of all places. Um, but it, it, it was redeeming for me. I was able to re reimagine my life. I was able to focus in. Um, but I know about that, that feeling of the uncertainty of, of leaving everything that I know and what I'm comfortable with. But um, so that was so that was a, a, a good time for you. So but prior to that, you know, there were some some kids that were hurt. I mean, we, we you know, kind of surmised there was folks bullying. Um, there are a couple of kids, though, involved in families that, that are hurting. But that's that's elementary school. And, and 
you know, I hope, you know, things went well for those folks afterwards. So now you're now you're in Virginia. Things are, are good. You're about 12 years old in Virginia. Are you are you still moving around after that? You know, military life? No, my father planted at the Pentagon. He was there for years. Mm, okay. And my sister was in high school. My older sister was in high school and I was in middle school. And then once I was out of middle school, the plan was I was going to high school where my sister was at. And we're all my friends that I had, you know, grown and have relationships with for the past, you know, two to three years. And my parents decided they wanted to purchase a new home with two acres of land and not in the neighborhood. And that zone was still at Woodbridge High School in Prince William County. What happened in the middle of that summer, the school zoning changed and the plans changed. So like 200 feet from our house, if you were, say, to the east of those mailboxes by a dirt road, you were going to Woodbridge. But if you were on the, the, the west side of those mailboxes, which we were barely, you had to go to Garfield. And I didn't want to go to Garfield. I didn't know anybody at Garfield. Mm -hmm. So it was shocking. You know, it, it was depression at its max for me at that point in my life. Uh, a preteen, my emotions were everywhere. You know, and I ended up having to go to this school where I didn't know anybody. So, again, I picked up that basketball and I was at the at the gym every single day. And mind you, I'm small. At that point, I'm like 4'11", 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. I go into that high school and I was intimidated. It was like an ocean of adults. You know, I couldn't believe it. And I, I was just, I was terrified. I didn't know how to react. But as time went along... I still played ball, you know, and at the at the rec centers for boys and girls girls club and AAU and still got friends everywhere I went. They ended up being OK. And the depression and the anxiety always went away. It was situational. Mm -hmm. So life was good. And and I got comfortable in high school. And then once I tried out for the basketball team, I was just way out of my I got out league, just outclassed in every single way. And they're like, you're not even in the right school, kid. Shouldn't you be in middle school? I mean, that's how small I was. So I was like, you know what? If that's like not going to be the way that I go on that basketball court, like I had dreamed to for, you know, the rest of my life, I'm going to try something different. So I went to my, my mom's and pop's cabinet above the, the stove and I picked up their bottle of liquor and I poured it into a cup and I went to my mother's ashtray where she sat by the fireplace every night when she smoked her cigarettes and put half of them out and re-smoked another one. And I ended up putting a bunch in a little bag and I went to the bus stop on that dirt road and I smoked my first cigarette and I drank my first shot of tequila. And it was, I felt like I was seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. And I got on that bus and I was flirting with girls and I was just, man, I was on fire. And people were like, man, what the heck? And then, what happened was at the at the rec center, I seen these these young men playing ball full court. And us youngsters and the scrubs and the adults that couldn't ball, they played on the three other hoops on the other half court. So when I wasn't playing, I would sit on the bleachers and watch these young men play. And I love the way they carry themselves. I love the way they have beautiful girls walking into the gym. I love the way Younger men would come in and show their allegiance and they would walk off when they had their pagers because it wasn't cell phones back in the day. And I just I was like, man, that's like in the movies. I'm like, I, you know, y'all would be cool to go play ball and, and run with them. What happened was one day I, I dribbled the ball home about a mile away and there was a car in our driveway. And I was like, OK, that's a different car. So I go in and put my ball down, take my shoes off. And I see two of those young men sitting on my couch talking to my mother and my father and my older sister. Hmm. I was like, man, what are these gang members doing in my house? You know, African-American young men. I'm like, wow, what are they doing here? And he's like, come here, little bro. And I went in there and, and I got introduced to him. He said, I've seen you over there playing ball at the wreck. You keep on practicing, you'll be able to run with us. Well, what happened was with, with me drinking and at the same time, about the same, you know, within a month, I lost my virginity to my next door neighbor of all people and that became an addiction just like the alcohol so you know needless to say i wasn't collecting baseball cards no more 
Right. You know, right. it was about females and drinking this liquor and I started smoking black and milds and you know, now I'm asking my mom to give me some Timberlands and I want some hoodies. And and they did. You know, my parents, you know, did what they could. They weren't making a ton of money. We were we were not wealthy by any stretch of the means, you know, and but they did what they could. And I ended up putting a pair of Timberlands on, putting on a hoodie, got some fatigues, started dressing like everybody out there. And um my sister's boyfriend was like, You're not to be affiliated, little bro. But within like that year, I started recruiting smaller gang members, like small gangs, but mm -hmm. like the ones that I knew could be killers to bring them to the table for my older brother, you know, because people thought that was like legit my older brother. He was a, a black man, but he was light skinned. And my hair was long, I got different hair, so now I'm getting braids and all of a sudden I get a beautiful woman, a female in school. And people are like, man, who is this dude? And then I'm at her, in her neighborhood walking around after school and gang members are pulling up in their Jeeps and their cars, masks on, putting guns in my head, putting guns in my mouth, testing me, trying to get me out of the neighborhood. But I wouldn't leave. I would not leave. And I went to get affiliated within that year after my sister's boyfriend gave me an alias. And that alias is Omen, O-M-E-N. Mm. And to me, that was everything because I was born on Friday the 13th, weekend of a full moon. I'm a Libra, scales of good and evil. My, my, my name is biblical. It's in the Bible. So when he gave me that alias without being affiliated, I ran with it. And I was like, OK, when fights broke out in high school, I would jump in and just start doing acts of violence, committing acts of violence just to show my allegiance to a gang that didn't even want me around. Right. Right. So you so it's, you 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 transition to a place where you're, you're trying to like like many young people looking for acceptance trying to figure out things young in life trying to find where you fit in and then you are exposed to some things you mentioned alcohol and smoking things that 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 masked your otherwise vulnerability or your, your otherwise maybe a, uh, i don't know if insecurity is the correct word but areas where you didn't feel as relevant in life and those things gave you confidence. Now add to it the society and, and the, the, the social issues of the gangs. And, you know, um, I, I, you had mentioned that the, the gang members were at the house with your parents. And I was trying to, you know, kind of imagine, you know, that scenario is in terms of, you know, what was the response from your from your mother and dad when they were there and, you know, what what made them go to your house and and you know I, I'm just trying to trying to figure out you know why did you ever find out why they were there or how they came to be speaking with your, your mother and father yeah so I, I apologize about that so my older sister was dating one of them oh I got you and and you know when you get branched out to these different nations of gangs they're broken down into different gangs per each nation the next thing you know they they branch out into D.C., you know, uh, Maryland, Virginia, they call it DMV. And they're in North, we're in Northern Virginia. We're right on the other side of the bridge, you know, Fairfax County, Alexandria, Prince William County. So her boyfriend ended up being one of the top ranking gangsters in that gang. And he was respected and feared and, and the gang was. So any smaller gangs in that neighborhood, in, in that region, in the metropolitan area, you're either in Alexandria, which were different gangs, or you wanted to go to a gang that was known nationwide. You know, and, and we just, they started recruiting, recruiting, and my sister was dating this young man for, for a while. And he would take me around, he'd take me to Georgetown Hoyas basketball games, go see Allen Iverson play. He would buy me clothes, he bought me the, the shirts that, you know, had my alias on it. All right. And, you know, it was flattering. It was. I knew he was cheating on my sister. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm rolling with a G right now. Like, this is this is fabulous. Mm -hmm. I'm like living a fabulous lifestyle. And I would see people that I went to middle school with that I hadn't seen in years. And all of a sudden, I had an ego and a name and, and my pride and puffing my little bird chest yeah, you out. Yeah, got some respect. Like, and, and yeah, I got a G. I got these. Yeah, uh -huh. I got some grown black men walking with me. You know, I'm just Caucasian. You know, Mexican Native American kid that people knew to be so innocent and sweet. Next thing you know, I'm wearing Timberlands and hoodies and bandanas around my neck. And when I went to go get a, initiated, 
it didn't work out so well for me, man. Like they asked me, yo, what are you gonna bring to the table? And before I could open my mouth, dude that asked me that got pushed out the way and somebody else hit me like dead in my temple. I was I was just gonna say, you know, it sounds all too familiar, you know, sort of the, you know, gang member taking you out and buying you things and shirts and letting you hang out, you know, all the grooming and preparing you to join in that situation. I'm going to I want to I want to definitely hear more, uh, have my audience hear more about this and, and then to, you know, talk about, you know, how these things come about in your book and, and what 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 comes after this. But we're going to take a quick break and come right back and and uh, finish up with this story. It's, it's um, a familiar story in, in many respects, but there's some unique aspects to it that I want to uh, bring out. So we'll be right back. You're listening to Let's Chew the Gum the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z while we chew the gum. My guest today is Joel Carroll. We'll be right back. Where do you watch TV? On watch TV. Nowhere. On watch TV. What's on watch TV? On watch TV is one of the most exciting channels on Roku and Amazon Fire TV with lots of categories to choose from, from movies to music, documentaries, and more. There's something for everyone. What if people want to place their content on Watch TV? You can visit the website onwatchtv.net to find out more or email onwatchtv at gmail.com. Don't forget, check out On Watch TV. See you on Watch TV. See you on Watch TV. On Watch TV is available now on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Check it out on Watch TV. Okay, thank you for listening to our sponsors. We're back with my guest, Joel Carroll. Uh, Joel's book is entitled The Book of Joel, Cunning, Baffling, and Powerful. And we're going to get into that conversation. Um, Joel, man, you, you've been telling a very uh, interesting set of a series of events that, that have occurred. You know, a, a lot of it is is what some folks don't experience in a lifetime. So, you know, you're you're being groomed to, you know, join into this gang. And, and, and I can only imagine you're feeling protected. You're feeling like you're somebody you're, you're, you're having an experience that a lot of a lot of people, not just young men, but a lot of people want, which is acceptance, love, a sense of family a, a pr protection, especially in light of the, the bullying that you experienced growing up, the teasing and whatnot. I can only imagine the empowering feeling that you were experiencing at that time. Am I correct? Absolutely. Acceptance, acceptance was everything. It was absolutely everything. I, uh, even though my sister's boyfriend didn't want me to get affiliated, you know, he was grooming me maybe without acknowledging it, but I was not by any means being accepted by the other brothers in that gang. So even my, my best friends at that time, I'll, I'll say my, my closest friends at that time that I played basketball with, they were getting affiliated with that gang. And immediately they changed their way. They changed their presence. They changed the way they spoke to me. They changed overnight. They, they went to bed, they woke up and they were a G, you know, and I, I knew it. I didn't question them. Right. You know, I just knew that. I go to their house after school, smoke some blunts, drink a little something. And then when, when something you know, came about or they got a page on their pager and they made that phone call. I, I walked to my girlfriend's house and spent some time over there without her mama knowing. And then when they were done doing what they were doing, I'd go back and hang out the whole time. My parents are thinking I'm out playing basketball. Sure. So what happens with some kids they're in their house, they can't leave the house at all because their parents are so strict because what is going on outside. And some parents like mine, they gave my sister and I a long leash Mm -hmm. A long leash, a long leash. That way they could work, make some amazing food because my parents can cook. And, and we would eat and they'd be like, go ahead and go out. And then they would think I was at like my friend's house from middle school. But the whole time I'm in Dale City, Virginia, not in Lake Ridge. And I'm out here smoking blunts. Now I'm starting to sell weed. I'm still not affiliated because once what I spoke about before, I went in, I was like, I'm a spiritual, I was a spiritual kid. You know, I'm a very spiritual man now. And and walking up those steps to, to get initiated and it didn't work out so well, you know, I'm just thinking these things through. And then when the young man got pushed out the way and another another young man hit me in my temple, 
I couldn't open my mouth for a week. I'd never been hit in my life. Mm. You know, that, that fight in Phoenix, that wasn't even a fight. Nobody even hit each other until I blacked out, and then we saw what happened. Right. But I'd never been hit. And then for this, I don't know, 20, 22-year-old young man, I'm, what, 15, 16, hit me in my temple? I'm colorblind. I ended up being in the military for a little while, but I, I, I can't see certain colors. Mm-hmm. And he hit me so hard. I saw orange out of one eye and purple out of another eye for four hours, mm. and I couldn't open my mouth. And he was, they were like, get out of here, kid. Like, what the hell are you doing, white boy? Get the hell out of here, man. Mm. But I was tenacious. I was like, I'm going to conquer this goal. It's going to happen. And I started committing more acts of violence with some of these gang members, and people started to know my name. Meanwhile, the entire time, I'm drinking. I'm drinking. I'm drinking. Now I'm now I'm drinking corn liquor. Home, you know, freshly made down in the basement corn liquor mm-hmm. for ten dollars a gallon in a mason jar. And that's just fueling my 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 fire to want to make a name for myself. Because if I wasn't gonna do that on the basketball court, I was gonna do it somewhere else. You were looking and for you were looking for you were looking for acceptance. You wanted to be it be accepted. My whole life. My entire life, I had wood in the fireplace at home with a, lo- a warm fire, great food. Parents could cook their, their butts off, you know, clean house. I had everything I needed as a child and a, and a young teenager. But I, I took off. You know, I, I went out of my parents' home looking for something, searching for something. And mm-hmm. when I ran away, it was, I was gone 19 years. I ended up going for 19 years trying to find something that I felt I wasn't having at home. And when I got affiliated, let me tell you, I'm telling you, I got what I signed up for. Like, I got the brakes beaten off me multiple times. Like, I was at a go-go in Washington, D.C. at the Icebox, and I felt the evil manifesting, and a small riot ensued in front of the stage, and I knew something was going to happen. When we walked out of the club, I got beat so bad, these dudes almost killed me. They put a hole in my face right above my lip that ripped my Timberlands off. My gang was up the street talking to girls, but I knew it was going to happen. You know, I'd seen people getting shot through the windows right around the corner from where we were walking, waiting to smoke a blunt. People that I looked up to, like a brother that were in my parents' house, get taken down south and executed on the side of a highway, and they don't find their bodies for two months. And what do I do about it? I start tripping off LSD. I start smoking formaldehyde. Go across the bridge to DC, dip my new ports in a in Ambana fluid, let it dry, and I'll smoke that. I didn't think about anything. I just didn't think. I just kept going. Now I'm cheating on my girlfriend. I'm like this pretty eyed, beautiful hair, white boy down here, and I'm sleeping with all these beautiful women, like young girls, and it was just I got lost. I felt like I was missing something out in society and I did never want to go home because I was just going to miss something like super intriguing. The whole time my parents thought, you know, I was still doing good until I started committing committing acts of violence in the school. I had a, a teacher reach and grab my hoodie. I was walking with my girlfriend. She reached, grabbed my hoodie. And back in those days in the early 90s, you had headphones, but they were big. Right. There was a cord on that Walkman. Right. There wasn't no CD player or none. It was a Walkman. And she yanked my hoodie and choked me with the cord. I didn't know who it was because if I knew who it was, I wouldn't have did what I did. But I turned around and I grabbed her bangs and I smacked her skull on the brick wall and I dropped this 58-year-old teacher. No, no. You know, I looked down on her. I'm like, don't, you know, in certain words, I'm like, don't you ever put your hands on me again. And then another situation, one of my closest guys that I was affiliated with, I was with him all the time. And this this other kid in my class was like making fun of him. He was all tripping on acid, and me and my guy were on on formaldehyde in our first period health class. And I'm like, just leave him alone, man. You don't want none of that. And he's like, we're cool, Omen. You're good, man. I'm just talking about Snoop Doggy Doggy Dog. I'm like, man, you don't want to do that, bro. I'm trying to tell you. So when I get disrespected, it's a trigger for me, and it doesn't have to be a lot of disrespect, but for me, it is. And that's when I snap. So after the bell rang. My brother, 
hits him with a three piece. He's in the corner of the bricks in the hallway. And I told him to be quiet. I told the young man to be quiet. I was like, just be quiet, man. I'm trying to help you out. And he said something to me. I don't know what he said. There's 150 students in this little area. And I just ran over there and kicked his forehead with my Timberland like it was a football. And he ended up in the hospital for a long time. Now, I don't know why I was doing what I was doing. Like, I was, I lost it. Yeah, I was going to say. As they gave me that name, it was straight violence. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, you, you get in so, so deep. And, and, and you know, there, there could be a variety of things. You spoke about the evil presence. You spoke about the, you know, substance abuse. And, and you know, one thing I do know for, for you know, young kids, adolescents, the brain, the brain development and, and you know, teenagers and young people don't go around thinking about this, but the brain is developing for for quite a while and, and it goes through stages and throughout adolescence and 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 those stages, you know, the, the types of things that you consume, um, whether it's accelerants or, you know, dipping cigarettes and LSD and alcohol, all, the, all those things stunt brain growth. All those things have a, a lasting effect, even when you think it's out of your system, you know, add to it trauma, add to it anxiety, add to it, you know, a society and a, and a, a young and misguided men. And, and, you know, the time frame you're talking about, that comes right on the heels of, you know, the crack epidemic throughout the, the country. And, and I bring that up because and, and obviously not the case with, with your family because your dad is there. Right. He's he's working in, in for the, the Pentagon or whatnot. But um, a lot of families and probably a lot of the young men that you were around that you look to as models. Right. You're you're young and impressionable. And that's a, a model to you. Right. That you know that they're doing bad, but, you know, they're getting attention. They're getting girls. There's there's the money. There's the lifestyle. Right. But a lot of those individuals are in situations where there is no father figure, a mother figure in the home because of, you know, crack epidemics, crack addictions, things like that. A lot of young people um, during that time were, for lack of a better term, running the streets. They were being worshipped in a sense by grown adults, you know, who were addicted. Um, and so that was it, it, it was it was just, you know, for me going through those periods all out, you know, hell, it, it was hell. It was like something that we had never seen before. Um, and, and that whole thing spread throughout the nation from inner cities to suburbs. And there's a whole reasoning behind it and why it happened. I, I teach some courses about that, but that'll be for a different show. So so through all that, man, t today, you know, you you, ha you have a different life. What what was the catalyst or, you know, the transition period that caused you to change? So I ended up after that period we just spoke about in high school, I ended up I ended up getting into um some pretty heavy things and I uh I got addicted to crack cocaine for five years. And I got kidnapped near Manassas, Virginia, when I was sleeping with an older woman. And she owed them money and she was on her way home. She had a job. She wasn't, you know, from the people on the outside looking in on what a crackhead would look like. There is no look, you know. Anybody could be an addict. It's just some people could handle their dope and some people couldn't. And I was one of those individuals for 19 years as a dope fiend that I could not handle my the substance abuse. And I ended up getting, or even before that, I mean, I got hit in the head with the police. Mac Light had a stroke in 98 after I got, I went to the military, you know, Virginia Army National Guard, mm -hmm. but the addiction took a hold of me and I didn't want to stop. So I got kicked out. I got honorably discharged in Virginia because I was using. Mm -hmm. And I ended up just couch surfing for, for decades in different states. And that kidnapping, um, and when I got hit in the head and had a stroke, that's when I started doing dope, like cocaine. And I did so much that my nose wouldn't allow me to do it because it just bled. And then I started smoking it. And then when they kidnapped me, I got hit in the head again where I already had a stroke. And that debilitated me, and I got beat by a cinder block out in the woods. I was sitting on a cinder block, and dude hit me. And he picked up the cinder block and, and hit me with it. 
and they dragged me to a, a truck. I knew it was going to happen because the door opened. Hmm. In the meantime, I got a, a, a beautiful daughter, you know, in 1999. And um, I would talk to God all the time. You know, I'd just be like, let me, let me break these chains of imprisonment of my own self. And I didn't know how to handle situations like being testified against in court with two of my G's after we did a jewelry store heist outside of Washington, D.C. And they got on the stand and they pointed at me and they, they said different words to try to change it up. So it didn't sound like they were telling on me, mm -hmm. but they did. You know, and so from that point on, and that was in the year 2000, I had homicidal ideation for 13 years. That means 13 years every day I, I'm waking up wanting these people dead. Mm -hmm. And the more people, you know, I turned myself in for the jewelry store thing. I did my time for my father who worked at the Pentagon. And then... What, what do you, what do you for, for my listening audience, uh, you know, we've talked about this, but, but what do you mean you, you did it for your father? So for the first time in my life, I did something self selflessly, you know, selfless act. My father was going to lose his security clearance at the Pentagon because I'm a known gang member in the North Virginia, D.C. area. And I was a convicted felon on the run. And I went to Florida where I was sleeping with another woman that I'd met down there. So I ended up turning myself in so he did not lose his security clearance and he can remain at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I went back after doing that selfless act. I went right back to being selfish again. You know, I did a six month faith based uh, all men's program being incarcerated during my time being incarcerated. And I caught, got closer to God. But the second those doors opened and my daughter and her mom were actually waiting on me when they left me that night. I went right back to doing what not doing what I was doing because I was kind of slow from the stroke. Mm -hmm. But. You know, it was back to just sleeping around women, passing around STDs. Once I got off probation, it was just, I was on, I was on fire, man. And uh, I just wanted to kill people. I really did. Like murder was on my mind for every single day for 13 years. Murder was on my mind. And smoking crack cocaine helped alleviate the action in going out and murdering these people because I got stuck on that dope. But once I got kidnapped, I left and went to Manassas and I met up with a female this is in 2003 met up with a female who was my wife today mm -hmm. and she she helped me to understand that there is life out there you know i was in those woods down in the backwoods by manassas and i was sleeping with like a 45 year old woman i was early 20s she might have been 50 i don't know but to see this young woman who had aspirations and goals and college and just listening to hip hop and go, go. And I'm like, okay, like, okay, now th there is life. You know, she was like an angel that pulled me out of hell. And I know I ain't never been to hell, but I've been to the gates and she really helped me to see that because I was homeless because mm -hmm. I still didn't want to go home to my mom and dad. Right. And she and her mother, strong black woman, single working at the Pentagon, her mother is, and my father was at the Pentagon. My father was in the Pentagon when the attacks happened on 9-11, and I didn't even care because I needed more dope. Wow. That's all in the book. Like, it's wild, man. I was in Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita in Louisiana. I didn't care that my wife's family was, there was missing family members. You know, I wanted more crack. Mm -hmm. So I, I moved to Shreveport, Louisiana with my lady and her mom, and they took me in, and then... After the hurricanes hit, and I was building swimming pools out there, and we moved to, uh, back to Arizona when my parents moved back. My older sister, her family and kids, they moved back, and they went to Tucson. So I was like, you know what? Let's do this. So I detoxed again on my own while driving a truck across the country. I've done this multiple times. Detoxing off alcohol and dope. Mm. I've done this many times, and it hurt. And I made it all the way. I put it to my parents' house, and the second we got to Tucson, it was at a Mexican restaurant. And it's back to me drinking again with my family members because I got a lot of family out here. And there's a lot of alcoholics in my family. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dope dealers in my family. Mm -hmm. So everywhere I went, it was like the, the promising side of life is going to get better because I'm not going to be around these people. Well, that wasn't the case because everywhere I went, I took with me. Right. I was the issue. My actions were the issues. It wasn't any place around the region and the planet or anything like that. I just had no self-will. 
And if I did, I was unwilling to search for that or listen to the wisdom of others who did it before me because I was a I know man. I wasn't a yes kid, but I was a I know man. Yeah. I know. Oh, I know. Yeah. So I ended up building swimming pools out here, cleaning swimming pools for prestigious people out here in the mountains. I wasn't doing no dope. And I said, you know what? I could cook my ass off. And somebody said, you should go You should go to the Art Institute. And I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do that. So me, my wife, and we ended up getting married. You know, we did cool things. I took her on a cruise. We went to Puerto Rico. We went down to, to the Caribbean and did all that. But the entire time, I was drinking and at bars with other people and not her. Oh, wow. So when we get back, somebody had broken into our house the day before Thanksgiving. And it freaked me out because my trauma in the past. Right. So I went to a family member. I was like, can I get some methamphetamine? Huh. And he's like, man, what you doing, Joel? He's like, man, I ain't having family members kill me, man. Nah, I was like, man, give me some. Somebody broke into my house. They went through all our stuff. Like, I can't sleep. I still got to go clean pools and do all this stuff. And boom, boom. Next thing you know, I'm doing just a little bit of meth. And now I'm sitting in my dark house while my wife is in bed. Not knowing I'm still up, but I'm seeing people come through the windows. I'm seeing demons mm -hmm. you know shadows like when i was a kid not on the dope when i was six years old mm -hmm. and now i'm up for like two three days now she's going to christmas parties at work and i'm not even going and then i got off that a little while later and got into a bad car accident before we got married and it hit me on the same side of my head where i have the stroke and i got stitches going through my eyebrow from the corner of my eye up through my eyebrow on the left side of my head this is when I learned I had a stroke when I got hit in the head at the club in Northern Virginia with that police Mac light. I never knew it. Wow. Because of the hospital in Virginia back in that day, they just sent me away because there was too many black people that were with me and they didn't like that. Right. There's too many gang members in the lobby when I was getting my, my braids were getting shaved off my head and they stapled my head and they didn't do a CAT scan. They didn't do anything. So you're talking about 10 years. Stroke survivor. Had no idea I had a stroke. I stuttered for six months, but I just smoked dope. Right. Wow. And this whole time, go ahead. Oh, no. No, continue, please. So, you know, I have a little girl. I had multiple women say I had kids. I had two women tell me I was pregnant with, uh, they're pregnant with my kid under the same 10 minutes. Two different phone calls. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go get high. I'm going to go sleep with somebody else. I'm going to go get a different STD. I was on a suicide mission for 19 years. I didn't care about it even when I cared about it because the curse and that dope wouldn't allow me to care about it. So we got $55,000 for my accident, $8,000 from the Obama administration for being a uh, first-time home buyers. We're married. Got nine thousand dollars on our taxes. But I got seventy-two grand. Never had that at one time in my life. Got CDs at the banks. Now they're calling me Mister Carroll. Now they know my name because I got a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this is crazy. And then she gets pregnant with my son. So I'm like, okay, I'm at the Art Institute. I'm cleaning some swimming pools. Life is good. My uncle gets me a truck. I'm paying up payments. Nice house. We're renting to own. Life is better than it has been in a long time. Still got rage issues since I was 10, plus the stroke that I you know, learned that I had a stroke after the car accident. But it all made sense. Mm -hmm. And then the, the executive chef at the Art Institute said, son, you have what it takes to be a great chef. I want you to go to the mountains. I'm setting up an interview. You're going to be a chef at the Ritz-Carlton. I'm like, what? Wow. He's got all that confidence in me. While I'm going through all this spiritual turmoil from never being able to talk about anything in my life and feeling that nobody could understand what I went through, I still went up there and I managed to get the job and I was a chef, not a cook. I walk in the door in Marana, Arizona, and they're like, good morning, chef. What do you need, chef? I couldn't believe it. It was the most spiritual thing of my entire life. Mm -hmm. You got a Native American man up at the top of the mountains, and that's how I've always meditated, through a native flute. And I'm like, this is it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. This is good. But this is what happened. I picked up one drink. I picked up one alcoholic beverage. And what happened then? They say in recovery, one is too many. One thousand is never enough. 
Mm-hmm. I end up doing a little bit of meth. Me and my uncle are bar hopping. He's got the dope. I get a DUI in front of a strip club. My wife's at home with my baby. It's all bad. I was so depressed. The next morning, I quit life. They took mm-hmm. my truck. They took my license. It's a 45-minute drive from where I live to the mountains. And I gave up. My parents, my dad rode under the garage door and asked me to stop drinking. It was 7.30 in the morning. I have no SUV. It's in the impound. My wife's pregnant with another son. And I said, you know what? I can't. I quit. Chef called me. He was like, you're late. You okay? I said, no, I'm not okay. He's like, you're coming in though, right? I said, no, I quit. And I hung up on him at the Ritz Carlton. Wow. The Art Institute called. You coming back? F off. Don't ever call me again. Wow. I left my wife pregnant that day. And I vanished for two and a half years on methamphetamine. And I'm not going to talk about everything that happened on meth. It's not for this show. It's in my book. It's sick. It's disturbing. It's evil. It's twisted. It was so twisted that I ended up in a mental institution off and on for two years. Everything that I did in my life, it came full right back around. And that dope did nothing but magnify it. And, and I became a pervert. So I went around perverted women and prostitutes all married. I was married. Jumping out of windows with axes and machetes and standoffs of police. High speed chases. I was a lunatic. And then somebody tried to get me to get some help. And they were praying and pleading for help. I had relatives trying to find me. That I've been here their whole life. And when that person that supported me for a long time tried to help me, I almost killed that person with a machete. I ended up back in the psych hospital. They threw me up in Pima County Jail. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I ended up 107 pounds. 107 pounds as a 34-year-old man. Hmm. Wearing paintball masks, hoodies, Timberlands, baseball gloves. That's why I walked around the street. I sold my nice SUV for $300 and a bag of dope. It was sinister. It was disgusting. And I hated myself. I was going to commit suicide by cop. In front of my estranged wife's house with two baby boys in there. And my mother-in-law sold her house in Virginia. Sold her house in Louisiana. And came in and moved into my house because I vanished for two and a half years. Hmm. And they held it together without me. And I didn't want to live no more. So instead of the police shooting me, I took the mask off and and there was a divine intervention at that moment and ended up being hogtied and thrown into a psych hospital again. And then one more time, I went back at it on the street after leaving his uh, rehab. And, um, I was going to jump in front of a vehicle in front of the psych hospital in the morning time. I just couldn't. There was a spiritual war going on inside me, man, that I knew was there. And everything that I went through in my life, I was still standing there on that sidewalk with two young sons 15 miles away and a daughter 3,000 miles away who was growing without her father. I just didn't see any hope. So I walked around that hospital for two hours, smoked my last two cigarettes. I had nothing left but a mustard seed of hope. That's all you That's need. all I had left. And that's that, that, it. And I walked in that hospital and I said, medicate me the way you want to medicate me. I'll be open minded to it. This is my last opportunity before I kill myself. And and what year was this? 2013. 2013. So so so. You know, fast forward, you know, 2021, you know, you have you have the book come out. What what precipitated the book? What what was what was your thought or what was the inspiration behind the book? So I did the rehab at the Salvation Army, all men structured, no cell phones. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Go to work, go to church, get a sponsor. Did that three times. A walk twice, went back, got down, gave my life to God. March 1st, 2013, gave my life to God. So much structure, which I had in my life before I ran away. I worked at a car wash, of all things, when I got out, but I became management of that car wash because I was honest, open, willing to learn new things, and there was no more lying. 
I just went in, showed up, did my work. People didn't like me because I got the job too quick and they moved up. But those same individuals would come to me and ask me for advice. And I'm like, this is crazy. I'm going to church every Wednesday night. I become a chairman of an AA meeting. Me, this dude. I'm like, what? This is crazy. And they're coming to me for advice. Hmm. And now I'm sharing my testimony in church because I'm sharing my testimony at all these meetings. And people are like, yo, this dude can speak. Like, this dude can speak. Go talk to this dude. Go to this meeting tonight. This dude, Joel, is going to share his story. People are getting chills. I'm like, God, this is really me. Like, I'm pinching myself. Father God, thank you. Like, this is incredible. My daughter flies out from Virginia at 14 years old with her mama and her grandmother just to see me. Me and her two younger brothers. Then my wife gives me two more sons. And then they're like, you need to get in the behavioral health field. So I end up getting denied the first two jobs that I went to because I wasn't clean long enough for them. But I ended up getting the perfect job for me, and that was at the mental hospital I was a patient at wow. as an advocate for men, women, and children. I was like, God, you got a personality. I'm telling you, you make me wait. You make me cry. You make me doubt myself. You make me get impatient and then ask for forgiveness for being impatient. And then the place that I was handcuffed and thrown into, I ended up being an advocate there for four years. But when I got that job, I had to get a security clearance, a fingerprint, level one fingerprint clearance card. Mm -hmm. And what they said, the state, Governor Ducey in Phoenix said he they, they needed everything, even if I wasn't convicted. I needed everything that I've ever been involved in that is on record. I'm like, oh, no. I said, babe, can you go ahead and get out to Virginia online and get this stuff sent over? I had, so I had a stolen car. I had a jewelry store, b and &E. I had domestic violence, threatening intimidation. I hit and run somebody, but I never got that charge because the dude in court said it wasn't me. And I got away with that. That was like 10 years for drinking and driving, no license in somebody else's car. So I start writing stories about all this while I have all these charges and almost charges on my dining room table. And I'm not educated, nor did I ever want to be educated as far as academics in high school. So I open this laptop my mother-in-law drops off to me. And I just start typing these little summaries of all these charges and what I learned from it. Mm -hmm. But I acknowledged all 20 of them except for that last one. I didn't acknowledge anything. That's why I committed number 21. It wasn't until 21 that I said, you know what? I can't be 107 pounds being incarcerated and not have food in America. When I'm drinking, when I'm on dope, I cannot starve. I will starve myself on purpose. But when I am clean and I have no means to food because I'm incarcerated at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and I already ate all my junk food I got in the commissary. Right. I said, no, I can't. I can't die like this. And it really changed me. It changed me. I said, I'm going to try this this one last time. So I ended up putting this summary together, sending it off to, to the governor's office. People are like, we'll see you next month. I went back to the car wash. They gave me the job. They didn't want to because they knew I was going to leave soon because they seen my faith and how I rode that whole two years when I was with them. They're like, you're going to be blessed. It's just you, whatever. You'll be gone in a week. And then the other manager was like, use him for a week. He's using us for a week. Just bring him back. Six days later, it didn't take a month like some of my buddies. It took me six days to get my fingerprint clearance card to go back. The day I finished typing that good cause exception for that level of that, that fingerprint clearance card, I started writing my book. Mm -hmm. That was in August of 2015. It just got published September 13th on a Friday <laughs> a few months ago. God is good. How about I'm telling that? you now. That 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 is some type of testimony and, and I, I sit here you know I I've heard and experienced lots of, of stories and traumas and you know sometimes you go through a lot of things and, and you get to a point where you find out all the things you've experienced to that date have come full circle for you to be in a position to have a positive influence on many people's lives and you know, people often ask the question, you know, did, did I have to go through all of that? Like, what, what was it all for? You know, what, what was the meaning of, of all this trauma and turmoil and, you know, predator type behavior, irresponsible, all the things you described? What, you know, was did you have to 
And I'm not ask, asking you, but, you know, the question is asked, do you have to go through all of that to get to a point? And and, and I don't think anyone can answer that, you know, but sometimes, you you know, folks have a, they'll have a revelation of like understanding, like, you know, I, wow, I had to go through all of that to get to this. But, you know, your story, I don't want to say it's exceptional because there's others with similar stories, but it is exceptional in the fact that not everyone gets to go through all of what you went through and not only live to tell about it, but to be able to be valued and restored to society to a point where you start to be a positive contributor and saving lives of others. Right. Not everyone gets to that point, you know, um, whether they got caught up in it's an overdose or maybe, you know, maybe they, they were shot by someone else. So, you know, that that's a that's a lot. You know, I, I understand the lifestyle you're explaining. You know, I know many people that have ventured into that realm and have not come out on, on the other side to be able to tell the story or tell their story. No pun intended. But, you know, that's what your your book represents to to, you know, hope for for individuals. Um, and, and I can only imagine when folks hear your testimony and, and they're in a similar situation, you know, because sometimes, you know, I, I was homeless as a as a teenager and, and you know, survived the struggles of inner cities and, and a lot of the things that you spoke of. And sometimes it seems as if there is no hope, there is no way out. And a lot of folks take the attitude of, well, I, I might as well roll with this lifestyle because, you know, if they're at school, you know, folks are labeling them and giving up on them in society. They're labeled and given up on and and it makes it easy um, for others to whether it's, it's you know, uh, some type of substance abuse to, to go into that realm to where they do become socially accepted. Right. Um, and, and, and so it, it ends that way. Man, it, it's. Uh, I wonder, you know, you wouldn't know at the time, but thinking back. And this is a bit of a loaded question in a sense, thinking back, you know, high school age or whatever. Do you think there was something, some anything that could have been done within the school system that might have deterred you from the life of trauma that you had to experience that might have, you know, captured you or captured or, or motivated you or in, in, encapsulated you into a a realm to where your life may have been different. Do you think there was something that could have been done in the school by teachers or anyone else? As hard as I was going at it, it's a simple no for me because they would try uh, mediation with the police in the school with me and other gang members. And all that did was give us like floor to um, threaten each other with our lives. Mm. You know, and I, while you're asking me that question, I'm like, well, what if I did go to my sister's school? You know, I know, I know all those folks over there, too. You know, now that I got on social media, you know, in the last year to promote my book and I'm seeing all these people I went to middle school with, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, that's you. You know, after everything that happened. And then I'm like, no, it, it didn't matter. It was just it would have been a different game. I don't you know, it's. With my daughter being born in 1999 and me not stepping up as a reliable and honest man and father to her and her mother, if that didn't work for me, nothing would have worked. Because mm-hmm. the day I held her at Bethesda Naval Hospital, on September 26, 1999, the way I felt when I held that little girl, and for me to put her back on her mama's lap and I walk off and go right back to that lifestyle, there's nothing that could have saved me at that point. Wow. You know, I, I, I asked that question because... You know, as an ju- just as as the person I am, you know, I, I'm the kind of person that, you know, will go the extra mile to, to help someone to, to to, you know, get down to their level to to do my best. Like I, I'll do my best to know that I did everything that I could to help an individual because, you know, because I, I, I made that encounter. You know, I, I'm, I'm it's difficult to me, difficult for me to not help individuals who I see in need. 
um, because I, I, I feel a responsibility to my brothers, to my sisters, humankind. I feel that responsibility. And, it, and, it's, and it's not a burden. It's just who I am as an individual. And so I asked that question because, you know, as a homeless teenager in South Central L.A., you know, it was the, the gang scene, the drug scene and whatnot. And, you know, a lot of a lot of all that going around and, and you have these temptations and, and I'm homeless and, and I'm 3000 miles away and I'm in need of acceptance in a sense. Um, and I was able to navigate it. And, and not that I didn't caught, get caught up in some situations, but I was able to navigate it and to, to get through. Um, I was going to make a very bad decision, in my opinion, and become a drug dealer. And I ended up going to the, to the military to kind of say, hey, you know, I was homeless. I was poor. I was desperate as a, as a kid. Um, but the reason for that question is because as a 17 year old, when I was homeless, I ended up working in a. Uh, in a nightclub, I had said I was 22 years old and, and I looked the part. I, I acted the part. Um, I was very comfortable around older women, older women, older people. I could hold a conversation. Um, but that's what I did. And, and I pl played football and uh, went to school. Um, but I was always falling asleep in class and uh, first period because I had just really gotten off work a couple hours before. Um, and I did that so much so and I'm failing. But. You know, people didn't say, you know, here's this homeless kid who's trying hard, um, was falling asleep. And, and to that credit, I never revealed that I was homeless. Right. And I don't know if a kid should have to. But the point is, the narrative was, you know, I was a lazy black inner city kid that didn't care. So, you know, you get looked over like no one is offering that extra help. You know, maybe there's one or two here and there. Um, and so as an educator now and as one that teaches future educators, um, I'm always reminding them to. You know, not give up on kids because, you know, I, I wasn't lazy. Right. I mean, I'm making every effort to be there, even though I just gotten off work. I have this rough lifestyle. I'm homeless and I'm, you know, you know folks are trying to get me to be in a gang and to, to sell dope and to, you know, pimp women and all these types of things. Um, but I'm there trying to find this, find my way. And so to that end today, um, uh, for my nonprofit, I have a scholarship that I'm offering to um students who have a 1.5 GPA or lower. And some folks are like, why would you you know, reward failure? Um, but it's not. It, it's an incentive to say, hey, just because you're failing doesn't mean you don't have value. Right. People, I'm, I'm failing this class because I'm falling asleep, not because I'm not smart. I'm a very smart guy, you know, um, at this time. And, and now I'd like to think still. Um, but the idea was, you know, when scholarships are announced and opportunities, oftentimes students who are failing, they, they don't even blink or look up because nothing is usually made available for them except the pathway to car incarceration or the life that even the life that you just described. And so I, my thought is, you know, with this incentive, you know, to give students an opportunity to, you know, have a chance to, to you know, earn some money through this scholarship, they, they simply answer a question, you know, how can teaching or learning about black history be beneficial for all people. Right. Um, and they can do it through an essay, but not just an essay, because there's so many literacies and ways that we communicate so they can, you know, write a, a original script or movie, a original song or performance, um, a social media campaign, a civic engagement, all types of ways they can do this and they can win money for that. Right. Um, and, and it's a two parter. The other part to that is they'll, so they'll get half of the money then or a portion of it, I should say, then. And at the end of the school year, if they have no F's, they get the remaining. Right. So 200 up front after, if they win and then another 300 if at the end there's no F's. And my, my idea is that it's an incentive for them to have something that, you know, they can believe in. Like, you know, I was able to do this. And then I was able to not have failing grades. Right. I'm motivated now. And so now they know that they can do it. Perhaps the next school year, they'll they'll stay on that path. So, you know, it, it's something the new, something different that I um, um, haven't done before. I haven't seen before. But I just thought even for you and others that, you know, I grew up with um, at that time that struggled through, you know, all the perils and ills of, of what you described. I just wonder if opportunities like that, you know, may have made a, a difference for, and, and I know for some it wouldn't, but for the ones we can, much like the work you're doing now, um, if you can save anybody, you know, it's worth it. You understand what I'm saying? I think it's extraordinary. 
Yeah. And how you broke that down right now, because something you said almost towards the end there was just somebody believing in. Yeah. To have somebody believing in you. And that's what I do today. I work in the behavioral health field with adults that are coming off fentanyl, methamphetamine, and alcohol, cocaine. I know people that huff gasoline. To speaking to them on their level, not somebody coming in and be like, hey, look, this, you know, they they feel the authenticity when I walk in that building. Sure. And I let them know off the break, like, this isn't going to be easy, man. But when I share my testimony, there's a line, you know, and I'm grateful for that. And I ain't saying this for my ego. You know, there's a line. And it's usually the people that mean mug me before I walk in there, before I set up and go in there. And they're looking at me with smirks on their face, like, what's this little dude going to say? Yep. And they give me an hour, and like you described earlier, when you just you just start freestyling back in the day, you don't know what you said. That's how I am when I share my testimony. Like, I just go. I just go. I'm, I'm anxious before I do it. I have doubt before I do it. And then I pray to God, just let it flow like milk and honey. And I say one word, and it's a rap. And then an hour later, it was a blur, and there's a line. And people are like, you get it. You understand. I, I need, can you mentor me? Yep, yep. Like you say, 25 years in the penitentiary. You know what I mean? Everything I've heard in there, and since I've been out, nobody said anything like that like you have. And I'm like, I'm, it's humbling. It's humbling because I believe in him. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. It's extraordinary. 1.5 or lower. That would have been me. Yeah, and, and it's that a lot of it's a lot of folks, and 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 you know, like I know that normally those are the students that are overlooked and and pushed to the side. You know, they're not being engaged with, but I know they're valuable because I I've been there. You know what I mean? And and it's again, it's important. Those the, and and I always tell folks, no matter what, those are still kids. You know, I, we we look growner sometimes. We talk a growner. We act certain ways, but they're still kids, and you know. And sometimes misguided. And so I think for anybody going into education, you know, it's important. And and, and those that have experiences where, where it's authentic, you know, it's not textbook sharing. It, it's life experiences and, and really understanding and related relating to individuals it, that authenticity matters. And, and which is, you know, like you said, people look and they hate on your scowl when you come in because like many people. They're being prejudiced. They're prejudging you could be your, on your size. It could be on your complexion. You know, just you're just another person coming in until they hear. And so I can I commend you on that, man. The lifestyle that you described, just like, you know, you have in the book title is cunning. It's baffling and powerful. It's all of those. You know, the the book of Joel it, it, it's a, a, an apt title for, for what you're doing, man. And, you know, obviously, I know you don't condone the lifestyle that you lived. You may feel like you were a victim of something. Someone may see you as different. I don't know how you feel about it, but ultimately you're at this place where had you not gone through that as an individual, you cannot be in a position to authentically, you know, approach, assist and develop so many others, man. So, you know, it, it's something to reconcile. So I just want to, you know, congratulate you on where you are. And, and hope that you continue to receive the blessings and the support for what you continue to do for the struggles that you may go through and that you continue to find value in what you do and understanding that, you know, there are so many people that have heard your story that are reading your book and hopefully going to read your book. So many people that are looking at you to say, hey, if he can do it and he did it, so can I. And they're going to continue to look to you, man. So I just want to, you know, push that positivity your way for you to be able to maintain. And, you know, you are an instant friend of the show. Let's chew the gum. <laughs> we have listeners, Amen. man, in over in over 50 countries. And man, so I hope that this message resonates with individuals um, and, uh, you know, folks, you know, go out and, and, and get the book. Where, where can they find your book? The Book of Joel, Cunning, Baffling and Powerful. Where can they find it? If you Google my name, Joel Carroll, J-O-E-L-C-A-R-R-O-L-L, -L -L, if you Google it with the book of Joel, you'll see it. You'll see it on there. You get Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target, iTunes, um, Google Play. My, my publisher, Fulton Books in Pennsylvania, 
and it has a demon on the cover with a tornado coming behind the demon, eyes coming through the clouds, and me handcuffed to a chair right in front of the demon. Hmm. Like it, you can't miss it because that's there. There's so many metaphors for that cover that we created. Like it's me looking at myself as a demon. It's the demon that was looking at me in Europe when I was a child. The mm-hmm. bones that are next to me when I'm handcuffed to the chair, out out by the tornado, it's the people around me. You know, and I've always told people, look, I've never lost anything in my life to people to death. I hear it all the time. I lost my house. I lost my wife. I lost my car. You ain't lose nothing. We made a decision that ultimately caused us to lose those things, but we gave it away. Mm. To the addiction. We gave it away for another female. We gave it away because our ego or our pride. Only thing I've lost was people to death. And that's what those bones represent. So you can find it on all those platforms. If you have somebody that is an addict or an alcoholic, read the book. It will give you some understanding on, on how we think and why we continuously go down that dark tunnel in addiction. If you're going to rehab and you need a good book to inspire you, Get the book. If you know somebody that's going through something, but you know they're uh, uh, an avid reader, a reader, it's a it's a good book. It's a it's 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 about the ending. It's not about all that experience. It's about where I found my strength and it's all the hope that I'm trying to to press out to this planet before I go on to meet the Lord. So I really do appreciate you. No man, I appreciate appreciate having you on the show to tell this compelling story. You guys go and check out that book for sure. And as you heard it, it's for everybody. If you, if you know someone going through it, if you're going through it, if you're an avid reader, right? We all know somebody that's going through something, and many of us are continuing to go through things, you know, with with everything that's going on in the world. So, again, big ups to you, man. Thank you so much to my audience that's listening. Um, this is Let's Chew the Gum, the podcast where we talk about everything from A to Z. Be sure to join me next week as my guest will be award winning actress, the renowned actress Eileen Grubber. She has a definitely another compelling story to tell about her amazing career from all her accolades in Hollywood and her outreach that she does for a larger community in the world. You won't want to miss it. Um, feel free to send follow up questions for my guest, Mr. Joel Carroll. You can send those to let's chew the gum at gmail dot com. Download the podcast wherever podcasts are available. Please continue to share with your friends as we continue to bring you compelling stories, and real life, authentic situations. Again, we talk about everything from A to Z. And remember, we always have something for your